St. Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the heavenly hosts, by the divine God, cast into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. Our Lady, Seat of Wisdom. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pick up again on our theme of divinity and, uh, uh, and the kingdom. Our blessed Lord goes to, uh, takes his apostles and he tramps up to a region that was about a day and a half out of his normal area of preaching. He goes up to a place, and we hear this recounted in the 16th chapter of Matthew's Gospel, he goes up to a place known as Caesarea Philippi. Now, Caesarea Philippi had quite the reputation uh, long before uh, our blessed Lord walked around. That was the region where uh, the kingdom of Israel worshipped pagan gods. Uh, there was a huge sheer rock wall that uh, was in Caesarea Philippi. Caesarea Philippi got its name because one of the uh, uh, kings uh, named Philip uh, built a temple there and named the region also uh, sort of shared the name with Caesar to sort of curry favor with the emperor. And even today, if you go to Caesarea Philippi, you can see these little niches carved in this huge wall. It's like a skyscraper, this huge wall. There's little niches all over the place where they used to have various sized uh, statues and images of the god Pan. Remember Pan with the flute and the half, you know, half uh, uh, mule or whatever bottom and the human top uh, and always playing the instruments. You see them in Greek mythology. And um, it is widely believed that in addition to animal sacrifices there to the gods, there also occurred human sacrifices there. So this area is repulsive to a good Jew. We're talking about in Jesus' day, absolutely repulsive that you would sacrifice humans to these fake gods. Um, so you sort of imagine, to a little bit of a degree, when Jesus says, "Come on, guys, you know, pack up your." hobo handkerchiefs, and let's head up to Caesarea Philippi. They'd have been, what? They don't go up there. And now understand the geography of this region. There was a, uh, this is, the, there's a big, huge pool sort of that gathers underneath this huge, sheer rock cliff. And it was believed that at the bottom of that pool was the passageway to Hades. And so the pool in this area right by it was referred to as the gates of hell. And it was right under the temple on the top of this uh, rock wall to the false gods. And it was built partially in honor of Caesar. So this area here represents all of the earthly power of a false religion with the gates of hell as its undergird and celebration of all earthly power and authority and majesty, a kingship is what this area is, uh, uh, is noted for. So Jesus makes a point, our blessed Lord makes a point of taking his disciples specifically to this place and I would make a quick little departure here. When you're reading sacred scripture, every single little thing in there has some significance to it. Everything. Because it's authored by men, but it's inspired by the Holy Spirit. Now, back in the day, anybody who would have heard, you know, in the first century, oh, especially first century Jews, because that's who the... Uh, 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 Go uh, Gospel of Matthew was written to, they hear, you know, Caesarea Philippi, well, they immediately know in their head, oh, 
you know, false big temple, false, you know, horrible, you know, stuff that goes on, you know, the symbol of the Roman rule in the end, that's what they hear. Same way today, when somebody says to us, oh, that's so Hollywood, well, we know exactly what that expression means, as left-wing, liberal, no moral, mostly bad movies, overcharged, that sort of thing. So when we hear Hollywood, something immediately, an image forms in our minds. Well, when Matthew writes Caesarea Philippi, instantly his audience knows what he's talking about. This is why, I'm still on the side note right here, this is why as Catholics, you can't just go to a Bible study, read something, and then all sit around in a kumbaya circle and say, so how does that make you feel? <laughs> well, that's very nice. What do, you th what do you think about that? I don't know. I'm the slightest idea what that means. I don't know. I don't know. I'm not trained in this stuff. I don't know. But the church is because the church produced the scriptures. So I would advise anybody sitting in here or listening at home or watching the DVD, if you are in a Bible study that is not directly in line with Catholic Church teaching, and then and the fact that it happens at a parish doesn't guarantee it's in line with Catholic. Matter of fact, it's almost a guarantee it's not. Uh, sometimes uh, in line with Catholic Church teaching, get out of it. It's corrupting to you. Because if you're not hearing things like this, like the setting of where the story happens is important. It isn't just, oh, Jesus says this to Peter, and then I get goosebumps, and that's all it means. And that reminds me of when I went to school and I had a friend. And, oh, wasn't that nice? <laughs> that's not what the scriptures mean. It may be the tr when the fullness of the truth of the scriptures is explained to you, then you can have an application of it in your life. But how you feel about the scriptures, how I feel about John chapter 4, verse 2, doesn't really matter. Quite frankly, our Lord doesn't care how I feel. He wants me to be saved. How I feel being dragged into heaven isn't part of the game. So, and I'll give you one other little side example. Uh, in John chapter 6, the, uh, John makes the point of telling us as Jesus is feeding, multiplying the loaves and uh, feeding the thousands, he makes the point of saying that the people sat down on the grass that was green. Why? Why does the Holy Spirit want you to know 2,000 years later that the grass was green they sat on? Is that really important? Yeah. First of all, it's important because it's in the sacred scriptures. Now, what's the importance of that particular thing? Because the rains only come in, uh, in Israel in the spring. Spring is when the Passover happens. So you know, because they're sitting on green grass, that this event that's happening, the multiplications of the loaves and fishes, is happening right around the same time as the Passover. And that's important because of what follows in the rest of John chapter 6. So you can't read anything in Scripture and just blow over it like it's unimportant. This is why if you go into a Catholic Bible study, uh, uh, it has to be a genuinely Catholic Bible study because no Protestant Bible study is going to give a hoot that the grass was green because they don't care what follows from that because they don't believe it. So you simply won't hear it. I would recommend, as a matter of fact, for people sitting here and at home uh, or watching the DVD, uh, if you're going to get a... Uh, uh, study scripture, not if, when you study scripture, because you should, as St. Ig uh, uh, Ignatius, uh, uh, St. Jerome said, ignorance of the scriptures is ignorance of Christ. You're a Catholic, you need to know the scripture. Um, that if you're going to do that, there's a wonderful commentary, absolutely wonderful commentary that was recommended by Archbishop Fulton Sheen called the Haydock. Commentary. If you don't know that, go look it up online. It's there, H-A-Y-D-O-C-K. Um, and start reading and start studying. Uh, another wonderfully moving uh, uh, series uh, of commentary on Scripture um, is the Navarre Bible series, N-A-V-A-R-R-E. The Navarre Bible series is uh, produced uh, at the University of Navarre uh, in Spain. And uh, it not only has commentary in it, but it also has uh, reflections in it, 
largely from St. Uh, Jose Maria Escriva, and, uh, uh, founder of Opus Dei, and uh, absolutely beautiful reflections. If you're going to study sacred scripture, which you should, Catholics, uh, you need to study sacred scripture with the mind of the church. Not sitting around, I feel like that reminds me of my birthday party, That's, which was really nice. And I know Jesus was there because I felt all goosebumpy. It's not sacred scripture study. That's strange psychology. So, so we go back now, and the Holy Spirit tells us that this event is happening at Caesarea Philippi. Caesarea Philippi is important for all the things we talked about before. And the water that comes out of the pool underneath the sheer rock wall is one of the headwaters of the River Jordan. So Jesus takes his apostles up to this place that has spiritual, temporal, and uh, um, spiritual and temporal uh, importance, as well as geographic importance. It's kind of a big deal that they're standing here. That's why we hear it in Scripture. And what do we hear? Who do people say the Son of Man is? Who do people say that I am? And of course, you hear the you know the answers from the apostles. It's also worthy. It's also uh, uh, noteworthy that when the when he asks them this, it's after they've all come back together after he sent them out two by two. He sends them out two by two. And he's going to towns, cure people, preach, da -da -da, all the stuff. And so now this is kind of the okay. Let's get together and have sort of the post mortem on how everything went. You went out and you preached. Okay, so so how did it all go? Who do all those people out there you talk to? Who do they say that I am? Well, it was tremendous. I one guy, you know, I was, I told one guy to get up. He was the leper, and he was cured. And I was this God. One guy says you're Elijah. Another guy says you're John the Baptist back from the dead. We rock, Jesus. This is cool. Look at the association we're in. Ha <laughs> ha! This is awesome. This is awesome. Who do you say that I am? You are the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And listen to the exchange that happens here. Pay very close attention. Catholics are familiar with this, but go deep into this now. Blessed are you, Simon, son of John, for not flesh and blood has revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Boy, is that a mouthful. We haven't even gotten to the really big part yet. That is a mouthful. He calls him Simon, son of John. There's only one other place in sacred scripture that our Lord refers to him as Simon, son of John. And that will be after Easter Sunday when they're sitting at the lakeside and Jesus says to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And he asks him that name three times. All, everything from there on out, after this scene in Caesarea Philippi, our Lord refers to him as Peter. Peter this, Peter that, Peter all, Peter, Peter, I have prayed for you, Peter, that you know, when you regain your strength, you may in turn strengthen your brothers. Peter, Satan has demanded to sift you all like wheat. Peter, go pay the temple tax for us. Peter, 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 Peter. And then all of a sudden, after the resurrection, here they are at the lake. Simon, son of John. Why? Why does he do that? Why does he go back to what he referred to him before? Because Simon, the son of John, had shrunk back from what our Lord had prophesied he was going to be. So he needed to be restored to Peter. By the way, for those of you who do not know, the Pope's first name was Simon Johnson. Son of John, Johnson. Simon Johnson, that's the Pope's first name. And then God gave him the name Peter. So Pope Peter, do you accept election, Peter? <laughs> uh, 
So here we are. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. What does Jesus say in the Gospel of John? No one comes to the Father except through me. And in this case, no one comes to me except through the Father. Because as we hear in John's Gospel, the Father and I are one. So this anointing of Peter, of Simon, is an act of the Holy Trinity. Blessed are you, Simon, son of John, for not flesh and blood has revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven, the first person of the Holy Trinity. For my part, the second person of the Holy Trinity, I say unto you, you are Peter. And on this rock, not this rock, I will build my church. Because on the top of that rock is a great, big, huge temple to the false gods. On this rock, I will build my church. Do you see how the Protestant argument about he's building it on his faith crumbles on the face of it when you understand where this happens and what he is saying. On this rock I will build my church. And down below there, underneath that pool, are the gates of hell. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So he establishes Peter. He brings the apostles up to the seat of theological, geological, political power, and he challenges it. You will not win. The gates of hell will not prevail over this rock and this church. And I give to you, I give to you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Imagine what Peter and the apostles must have been experiencing here. At this moment, first of all, Peter, who most likely at this point probably would have been kneeling down, if not passed out. <laughs> and the apostles, those great toe kickers and you know, shoveling the dirt around when they're asked who they were, who Jesus is, are going, I don't, I don't know what's going on here, but this is hardly, and we came up here kind of to have a party. And what's going on? I give to you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. The keys. Keys are a big deal. We still sort of have this tradition or honor. We have an echo of this still even in our own day to day. You know, you give the keys of the city to somebody. Uh, there's, a, uh, there's an old newsreel. You knew I'd have to get Notre Dame in here somehow. There's an old newsreel of Newt Rockney getting the keys to New York City for the day back in, I think, 1924, I think, or 25. We just won one of our many illustrious national championships. And uh, uh, Newt Rockney had been invited to New York City, and they gave him the keys to the city. It's obvious it's, he wasn't mayor for a day, but you know, it's the honor of it. Well, that honor comes from this tradition of way back in the days of antiquity that all of these great cities had a key bearer. That person exercised their authority in the name of the king. They were the viceroy of the divine majesty. They unlocked the city gates every day. Because unlike now, where you leave your, you know, the entrances to the cities open and you know, liberals come in, well, and progressives and modernists come in. Back in the day, they used to shut, they were smart, they shut the thing and they locked it. So only normal thinking people could get in. But when our Lord says, I give to you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever you bind on earth 
shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Those words, the power to bind and loose, were words in Jewish law that gave you the authority. It was passed on to you. It's not just a nice way of saying it. It was a legal expression, like signing a document and passing it over. It wasn't just a nice way of saying it. And so when the apostles are hearing this, he has the power to bind and loose? Simon? Really? There's a, uh, one of the first principles in philosophy is you cannot give what you do not have. So when Jesus uses the word, I give you, he's not, I'm investing, I'm not, he says, give. He pours onto Peter his own divine authority. In Isaiah chapter 22, there is a scene where the key holder of the city is a really bad guy. And our blessed Lord, or wrong way to refer to it, God, says, uh, I will take the key away from you, and I will put it on the shoulders of one who deserves it. And what he shuts, no one shall open. And what he opens, no one will shut. Why? Because he has the authority of the king doing this. He does it in the king's name, and the only one who can take that authority away from him is the king. So, he also says to him, and he shall be a father to his people. So, the key holder really gets to the point where he sort of stands in the place of, doesn't substitute for him, but he stands in the place of the majesty of the, the, the royalty. That expression, uh, that line from Isaiah chapter 22, uh, he shall be a father, is where we get the expression as popes uh, of uh, people of calling, Catholics calling the Pope the Holy Father. That's where it comes from, Isaiah chapter 22. Papa, father, he shall be a father to his people. So all of this is happening, standing here underneath this big rock wall, an imposing scene. You go there, you just go to the, um, uh, the Holy Land today. This wall is still imposing. It's huge. It's gigantic, and all the waters are bubbling up there. I mean, it's, it's quite the impressive, you know, it's got sort of the same uh, sort of geographic awe strike about it as when we as Americans would go to like the Grand Canyon or uh, Yellowstone or something like that. And you're standing there going, wow, this is really impressive which is why the political power is in charge, and you know, they always want to go to the most impressive place because it seems to bolster their power, at least when you look at it. So they, you know, they always go and build beautiful buildings to themselves, and they say they belong to you, but try getting into them when you want to go in. Um, and uh, so they always find the most impressive place to build something so that it puts into your mind psychologically, wow, this is a powerful thing. So that's why they built this temple there. So Jesus goes right up to this temple, right up to it, and says essentially to hell with you, this is the rock. The gates of hell will not prevail against this. He declares war on hell at Caesarea Philippi. We have these nice images from medieval art of a soft Jesus handing over keys daintily to a little Peter kind of stunned well, as beautiful as works of art as those are, they don't capture the real, real sense of what is going on here. The kingdom of heaven, who is Christ? Remember, he says in the Gospel of Matthew, the kingdom of heaven, behold, pointing at himself, behold, is among you. He is the kingdom of heaven. And he invests all of that authority in Peter. And he takes the game right to the opponent. And this isn't some quiet little thing done in some, you know, behind some little pub in Jerusalem. He marches them up there like an army, says, here's the deal. 
you have my authority and the gates of hell will not prevail against you. You're here challenging the gates of hell. So many times Catholics have this notion in their head that we're supposed to sort of sit back and just kind of, you know, take these, you know, onslaughts as they come in and just kind of cower down and my foot, that's what you're supposed to do. You weren't baptized, you weren't confirmed, confirmed, firmed is what that sacrament is for. It's to defend and advance the faith. Nowhere, nowhere in sacred scripture will you find a comment where Jesus says, when the truth is said, or when somebody's saying a lie, just shut up. Just be quiet. Oh, sure, accept your own crosses. First of all, that's not being weak, that's being strong. The weak thing is to reject the cross. The strong thing is to bear it. What Jesus demands of us is strength and power and fortitude. You go down the list, the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit. The seven gifts are not of the Holy Spirit are not um, be tolerant, don't be judgmental, be nice. Those are not the gifts. Wisdom, strength, power, understanding. These are the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because you need them to challenge the gates of hell. You do not challenge and overcome the gates of hell by being timid and being meek in the sense, not the theological sense, but the personality sense of being meek. You do not conquer hell that way. And your charge from the king, I give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Your charge is to attack hell. That's why he says the gates of hell will not prevail. Gates can't attack. Gates are the, the doors in. They don't, gates don't become detached from, a, from a, uh, uh, a, a wall and go out and attack something. You attack the gates. And the gates of hell will not prevail against this kingdom that I am establishing right now, and I'm establishing it on you, Peter. And to make that point, I'm doing what my father did Always in the Old Testament, I'm changing your name. I'm changing your name. I, the king, am changing your name. I am giving you my authority. Now attack. If you don't see the church as a big offensive weapon, you've missed the point of the church. When our Lord came to earth, it was a sneak attack. He went behind enemy lines. He speaks in terms of this royalty all the time, even with regard to Satan. At the Last Supper, he says, now is the prince of this world, prince of this world, cast out. Why? Well, because the king has shown up. The prince may have all the power he wants, until the king shows up, then the prince can leave the room. Kingship, the kingdom. And what is he doing? He's building and expanding and slowly revealing the kingdom. And now he's beginning to establish the hierarchy of the kingdom for when he will be gone. This is why it's important that the risen king in front of the apostles re-establish Simon, son of John, as the man. Because they all knew that he had denied him. And as our uh, Wonderful Archbishop Fulton Sheen tells the story, you know, the word love in uh, English doesn't begin to have the richness associated with it that the word love uh, does uh, in the scriptures. It's three different words for love in the scriptures. And our blessed Lord asks Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? That love that he said was, do you love me with the supernatural love that you would go to the grave 
for me over with the most supreme type of love. And Peter answers, yes, Lord, you know I love you. But the love that he says back is, yes, I love you as a friend. Yes, I love you. And so our Lord says to him, feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me with that supernatural, you will go to your death for me kind of love? And Peter answers back, yes, Lord, you know I love like a friend, love you. Feed my lambs. And the third time our Lord says, Peter, do you love me like a friend on that lower level. I've asked you twice on the supreme level of love and you've answered me twice on the lower level of love. So I will step down to you, your king will step down to you and ask you, do you love me on this level? And it's at this point Peter becomes distressed because he has just said twice that he loves him on this level. Yes, Lord, you know all things. Feed my lambs. And now I say to you, when you were young, you fastened your belt around you and you went wherever you wanted to go. But when you are older, you will stretch out your hands and someone will tie you fast and they will take you where you do not want to go. And John tells us, in this manner, Jesus predicted the sort of death Peter was to die. Because in the end, the kingship, the involvement in the kingship of Christ requires total sacrifice. For the moment, our Lord was willing to accept Peter's lower type of love. But he predicts to him that, Peter, you will love with a supernatural love me before you die. But right now, we take this love. And it is sufficient, and I restore you because I give you the command to feed my sheep. A short while later, Jesus ascends to heaven. Nine days after that, as we know, it's Pentecost. Peter kicks open the doors and goes, You Jews killed him! This was the Messiah. Let me show you the whole truth of what happened and what you did. And that day, 3,000 people were added to their number. Peter was growing into his role as Pope. To you I give the keys of the kingdom of heaven. So where was the Holy Spirit? God the Father shows, uh, gives Peter the grace to be able to see through the humanity, through the flesh and blood of our Lord, and see through that to the divinity of Christ. The second person of the Trinity gives him his power to be the leader of this group. So where's the Holy Spirit in this scene? The Holy Spirit is present in the fact that the church is now established on Peter. This is represented if you ever have the opportunity to ever go to Rome and go into St. Peter's Basilica, the only stained glass window in the entire basilica, which is the size of Maryland, uh, is that beautiful window of the Holy Spirit, that amber window, oval-shaped window above the throne of Peter in the very back of St. Peter's. Uh, that chapel back there is the chapel of the throne, uh, or the chair, sorry, the, the chapel of the chair of Peter. Um, so the Holy, the, the Holy Trinity, the Blessed Trinity is what's present at this moment. It's the Holy Trinity that's offended by 
the goings-on at the place they're at. There is nothing quiet or meek about the way our king gives us our orders and the nature of our orders and what we need to do. You are commissioned to go out into the world and subdue the gates of hell. In your life, whatever your circumstances of your life are, I can't obviously speak to the circumstances of anybody's life, I can barely speak to my own, but whatever the circumstances of your life are, the people that you know who have left the church, people who don't know anything about the church, people who don't understand this, that, or the other because they were poorly catechized, because they were taught at the hands of modernist, progressive, heretic, liberals. Did I cover everything? Yeah. Um, and, uh, and their faith was destroyed or never given the opportunity to blossom. If you know the truth, and you know the truth, you're held accountable for not preaching that truth. In season and out, you have that charge. It isn't just up, it may be up to the apostles to actually administer the sacraments of baptism and go out and baptize the world, and, but it is up to you to sanctify the world through your lives and not just sitting around being, well, I live a nice life, I go to this devotion and I go to Mass and I do this and I, do, I pray this and the other. That's wonderful and enough. Particularly today in the 21st century, it's not enough. Look around. Look around. You cannot be heirs of the kingdom without participating in the work of the king. It cannot be done. It's walking into the wedding banquet without your garment. There are no shortcuts into this kingdom. If you love me, you must reject, you must deny your very self and pick up your cross and follow me. That's your throne. Your throne is your cross, just as our Lord's throne was his cross. And however uncomfortable or awkward or out of step that reality, when you absorb that reality, however uncomfortable or awkward or rotten that makes your life become vis-a-vis -vis your relationships with other people, too bad. Too bad. If you have children who've left the faith, family, friends, whatever, if you have people who you know are interested in coming into the faith and they're hearing horrible stuff, you don't get to say, oh, well, Father Justinus doesn't really say things very nicely. Let's have a cup of tea and go play golf. You have to sit down and explain this stuff to them. You must know the faith. You must know the faith and live the faith. And that doesn't mean just in your private devotions. That means in all aspects of your life. Love the Lord your God with all your mind, intellect, heart, your devotional life, soul, everything about you, and give it all your strength, every bit of your human personality that I knit together in your mother's womb, that I knew before the dawn, that I commissioned, that I bore with you in my mind, in my bosom from all eternity. That's your charge. That's your charge. The apostles obviously got this. Okay, they were a little slow, but they got it because with the exception of John, every one of them was martyred. Every one of them was martyred, some of them in horrible ways. You know, you, know, you, remember, you guys know what happened to James? They threw him off the, the high tower of the temple, you know, which was down, they guesstimate, six stories. He got thrown off, you know, thrown off a roof for six stories. And they went down there, and poor James wasn't dead. So he's laying down there. He's probably very messed up. You know, they, as they say, it's not the fall that kills you. It's the sudden stop. And he was still alive. So then they came after him and finished him off with clubs. They threw him off the temple and then pound his head in with baseball bats. No greater love hath man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends 
if you do what I command you. Now, I'm not saying go get yourself thrown off a building. If that happens, then you just scream out a Hail Mary on the way down <laughs> really fast. <laughs> or better yet, an act of contrition. Um, but you do whatever you have to do. And the whatever you have to do is, is whatever the circumstances are in your own life. But this is the price of entry into this kingdom. Again, go back to the book of Revelation. Who are the people standing around the throne? They are the people, and John makes it very clear. There is no way to walk away from that book and think just, oh, you know, Uncle Bob was a nice guy, committed adultery, had six wives and stuff. But, you know, he's a nice guy. He used to give me money to go buy candy bars. Well, of course he's in heaven. You cannot read anything in Scripture and have that kind of illusion. You're, you're, you're smoking something. It is the people who have had their robes washed in the blood of the Lamb, the martyrs. When you go into the section of the book of Revelation where we're talking about the... Uh, um, where, where uh, John is describing the temple. He describes the altar. And underneath the altar, he says, um, uh, the martyrs are crying out. Why would the martyrs be under the altar? Well, remember, the temple on earth is an imperfect replica of the temple in heaven, which when John is writing this, has been destroyed by Roman legions, Titus and his 10th legion. It's in crumble, in, in ruins. So John is seeing the temple in heaven. Why are the martyrs under the altar? Because in the temple, on the earthly temple, when the blood uh, came pouring out of the necks of the bulls and goats and lambs and everything, it ran down channels and collected in a pool under the altar. And then, on a number of occasions during the day or the week, the priests of the temple would release a great big huge gate like a dam, and that blood would flow down into the little stream in the Kidron Valley, and was oftentimes red. So think about that. When Jesus gets done at the Last Supper, where does he go? takes his apostles, and he walks across the Kidron Valley. They would have walked into that stream to get over to the Garden of Gethsemane. And after Judas betrayed him, they would have come back across the Kidron Valley, Jesus all bound up, probably being beat around the head by the temple guards and the Roman soldiers, and would have walked back through that same stream with the blood of the uh, animals that had been sacrificed flowing through it. This is the kingdom. This is the kingdom that you belong to. This is the kingdom you were baptized into. When we see at a funeral mass and we hear those lines, in baptism, Fred died with Christ. Now may he also rise with Christ. There is a price to pay to be in this kingdom. And that price is your life. It may not be your physical life in martyrdom, but it is your life. It is my life. It is everything in us that does not conform to Christ. Anything and everything. The reason the devotional life is important is because it keeps that truth in front of you. The reason the sacramental life is important is because it gives you the sanctifying grace to overcome these things. The reason the intellectual life is important is because it gives you the knowledge to realize what you're doing is correct. Because it isn't just faith, but it's faith and reason. And it's why you must know the faith. It's why this same Peter, who had the keys handed to him, says... Always be prepared to give a reason for your hope. Not go, I blah, 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 and speak in tongues, but give a reason for your hope. Not to throw down and roll around the aisles and scream and have you know, Benny Hinn shove you over and ask you for $1,000. Always give a reason for your hope. 
Well, where does the hope come from? Well, hope comes from God. It's one of the theological virtues. See how all of this ties together? How the theological virtues of faith, hope, and charity, faith, hope, and charity are infused into us, and then we cooperate with the infusion of that uh, theolo- of those theological virtues by what we do, by what we know and what we do. What defines a human being? Your intellect, your free will, and your matter. And the only difference there between us and the angels is this body. That's it. So you get into this kingdom by picking up our lazy matter and dragging it to whatever source of intellectual infusion we need, books, DVDs, internets, conferences, whatever, and then you let that fill you up and cooperate with that grace to motivate you and move you to sanctity. And that sanctity is now available to Almighty God, to your king. You lay yourself down in front of your king and say, use me in whatever way you want to use me. And you become a sword in the hand of God who says, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. What is it? My church. And I, the king, will assault and attack and I will lay siege against this hellish kingdom using you because you have allowed me to use you. This is why you kneel before your king in Holy Communion. This is why we kneel when we formally pray together as communities. This is our king. And all of this As it's happening, you are being lifted to nobility. You are being raised. You are fulfilling your noble calling. I I can't help but remember, I I even hate to bring the name up, but during the, well, I won't bring the name up, during the 2008 election, the current occupant of the Oval Office while it was still a campaign towards the end, said when the numbers were tightening up, at least they appeared to be tightening up, he gave a speech in Ohio where he was talking about them. That would be you. He was talking about them, and he said, if they bring a knife to the fight, you bring a gun. Well, my view on the spiritual battle is if they bring a gun to the battle, you bring a nuclear warhead. This is, this is what the faith is. We've been so in the church, no offense, ladies, but this is a masculine understanding of things, and the church has been way over-feminized for the last 40 or 50 years. You go and you look at the saints of the church, the men of the church, and these guys were men. They were men. They would destroy somebody who attacked the church, even said anything about, I don't mean physically destroy, I mean they would destroy their argument. I was uh, privileged to have served Mass when I was 14 for Archbishop Sheen. Uh, It was the Feast of the Bicentennial of the United States, July 4th, 1976, and he was the guest homilist in St. Mary's. And he said, uh, we were in the sacristy afterwards, and uh, the altar boys and I had the incense and the whole cathedral was like a cloud. You couldn't see anything because I love incense. And uh, <laughs> it's so cool. And uh, I was doing the 360 degrees with it be- before anybody even knew to do that. And, uh, and uh, so Bishop Sheen's standing there talking to a group of us, the altar boys, and, and he says, now which one of you was the, uh, who, who was in charge of the incense? <laughs> And I thought, oh, God, I'm in trouble. 
And just as he asks the question, this fellow comes walking in from the other side of the sacristy. It was a cathedral in San Francisco. It was a big old sacristy, and we were on the one end, end of it, and this fellow comes walking in. He's kind of a reasonably dressed hippie kind of, you know, Haight-Ashbury kind of guy, but he looks somewhat respectable. And he says, uh, and he says, oh, Bishop Sheen, Bishop Sheen, I, uh, I've, I've, I've just finished writing this book. I came back from a trip to the Far East, and I've written a book combining the best of Eastern mysticism and Roman Catholicism, or Catholicism. And uh, sweet little 76-year-old Bishop Sheen, he's going, oh, God, the incense turns around. He goes, get out! Get out! The Catholic gift is a gift from Almighty God. I will not have you polluting it here. Get out! And we're all like... <laughs> and he says, now, who did the incense? <laughs> That's a man. That's a man. Because the love of his life was attacked. Did the guy mean to attack it? I don't know. I don't know what his intention was. But when you're in love, you respond out of love. If he did that today, I can imagine, you know, the, 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 you know, some, you know, some members of the hierarchy would probably feel the need to rush out and issue a press release that said, well, he shouldn't have been so judgmental. A little bit more understanding and a little more tolerant and, you know. There was no saint in the history of the Catholic Church for 2,000 years who tolerated an attack on the Bride of Christ ever, ever. <laughs> you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against her, it for you uh, and to you I give the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. That one teeny little phrase, that one teeny little phrase, what was that, maybe what, 100 words or so? Out of the 750,000 words in the Bible, there's 100, maybe it's 100, that lay out the truth of the scriptures. You can find that all over the sacred scriptures, particularly in the Gospels, but all over the sacred scriptures, everywhere. In the book of Genesis, when God tells um, Adam and Eve uh, not to eat of the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden, how many trees specifically are pointed to in that story, in that account. Don't eat the tree of the fruit in the little garden. There's two trees in that account. One kind of gets blown over pretty quickly, but there's two trees in that account. The one is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and the other is the tree of life. And it's almost in the few opening words of the book of Genesis, that we hear about the tree of life. And then it just simply disappears from sacred scripture. For thousands and thousands and thousands of years, we hear nothing about it ever again. But it was the reason, it was the reason, that tree of life is the reason Adam and Eve are kicked out of the garden. Think about the end of the story. He curses the serpent he uh, curses Adam, Eve, the ground, everything. And then he says, we must not allow the man to stretch out his hand and take the fruit from the tree of life. And that's what we get thrown out for. We're going to pick up on that theme in the afternoon because I have to have you hang around and stay awake. <laughs> but that tree makes its appearance again in the very last chapter of the last book of the Bible, chapter 22 of Revelation, all of a sudden there's the tree of life again in the heavenly kingdom with the river of life flowing right through it, reaching out its branches on both sides of the banks. And now all of a sudden, restored man and the tree of life, which we could not touch before, now is totally available to us whenever we want it. 
the tree of life makes its appearance again at the end of the world, in heaven, in the kingdom. <laughs>